Well, good morning. Beautiful sunny day in Belleville, Pennsylvania. And since our church is closed, it's just Fred and I, and we would like to welcome our church family from the Upper Room Worship Center and all of our Facebook friends and family who are joining with us. We are located at 4567 East Main Street for those of you that you don't know anything about us, and we would love to have you join us on Sunday mornings uh, at 1030 where we will gather when we gather together again. So I want to thank everybody for their messages and their texts and um, how you've let me know that God is touching your heart through these video messages. So we are believing for massive miracles and I've been holding up this box of believe and we have all kinds of prayer requests in here and so I just want to lift up all the prayer requests that we have and also many of you have prayer requests out there perhaps you've lost a job perhaps um, there are people that have this corona and or you may have it yourself <coughs> so excuse me so we are going to pray over this over many prayer requests. So Father, we just praise you and we worship you, Lord. And we just believe for massive miracles because we know, God, that you're a God who loves us and cares about everything about us. And so we praise and we worship you. And we bring everyone into your throne room of mercy and grace. And we just lay them at the feet of Jesus. We serve a risen Savior and we celebrate our Father and our Jesus and Holy Spirit, thank you for loving us and helping us to get through all the darkness around us. You are our shining light. So we look to you who is leading us through the darkness of this world. You are the author and the finisher of all of our faith and we take authority over that spirit of discouragement and fear in the name of Jesus. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. So thank you for bringing much encouragement to each one of us as we listen to your message this morning, that God, you always have hope for us. So Holy Spirit, we give you this service and we ask you to fill my mouth with your words of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So this week, as I was praying for my daughter and also uh, my mother and all the different ones that are in nursing homes that have the corona, all of those situations that are going on, um, I asked the Lord for a specific scripture uh, to declare. And I opened up my Bible to this scripture. Do you know that you can come to the Lord and you can ask him for a specific scripture to stand on? that you will hold on to and believe. And every time the enemy comes in with all that negativity, you can stand on that scripture. And this is the scripture that he took me to, and it's Luke 1, in the Amplified. For with God, nothing is ever impossible. Catch that word, ever, ever impossible. And no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. So I'm going to encourage you to say this with me as I repeat this. For with God, nothing is ever impossible. And no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. So in this scripture, verse 38, Mary responds because the angel has said this to her. And now Mary comes and she comes with her response. And she says, behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to what you have said. And then the angel left. Those are powerful words to say. So as I meditated on this scripture, I realized this is where Mary was saying to the Lord, whatever I have to go through, I surrender it all to you. I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to give it all to you, and I'm going to trust you and rely on you and cling to you. And, you know, I know that God has given me his written and his spoken words throughout 
past and present and all those hard times. But I knew in this scripture that God was showing me the power in his words. So I want you to really take a hold of that this morning. The power in his words. And right now we are still fighting the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy our loved ones and the economy through this pandemic. However, when we surrender all of our life to him and agree with his word, his word is powerful. Now, I also took notice that the angel left as soon as Mary surrendered her life to the Lord. She was giving him all her plans and aspirations for her life, and she was willing to go through whatever God's plan was. Remember, she never had gone to bed with Joseph. So Mary was going to have to go through a lot of judgment, criticism, and fearing for the lives of her and Joseph and baby Jesus. She would go through Joseph's death in the years ahead. And in the end, she would watch Jesus, her baby boy, suffer an agonizing death beyond what she could ever think or imagine. However, God saw her heart for him. It was no longer about her, but her life was all about God and what his plan was for her life. But you see, God is faithful, and no spoken word or written word shall be without power or impossible of God fulfilling. He is faithful. So say that with me. He is faithful. And take a hold of that into your spirit, because God is faithful. No matter what we're going through, he is faithful. You know, we have seen that our life can change suddenly, as it has with this coronavirus invading the whole world. It's unthinkable that our world has been turned upside down suddenly in 2020. And so many trusted prophets were saying this was going to be a year of many blessings. Yet, what if this is what we've had to go through to come closer to the Lord and stop playing church? I believe that God is calling us to return to our first love. So I want you to think about when you first accepted Jesus into your heart. You were so excited, and you wanted everyone to know about him. However, years went on and on, and prayers were not answered, and hard times came, and you didn't see what you wanted. And some of you have walked away from God, and other things in your life have taken precedence. So what if God is allowing this to raise us up to learn how to fight the enemy and stop fighting ourselves and each other? Honestly, I really believe it saddens the heart of God when he sees his children fighting each other. You know, think about it as a parent. You don't want your children fighting each other. That hurts your heart. You want them to get along. And that's what God wants to see in his children. People are not our enemy. Satan and his cohorts use wounded people to fight each other. And sad to say, we're all guilty of that in times of our lives. And this week, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, expect miracles. So the title of this message is Expect Miracles. And before this message, I held up that belief box, and I told you our church has been believing for massive miracles. So I want you to think about this. When we are in the darkness of not being able to see ahead, that is when we need a miracle. When we come to the end of our rope, that is when we need a miracle. When all looks like nothing is ever going to change, we need a miracle. But most of all, when we completely surrender our health, our finances, our plans, everything that has come between us and our Father, that's when God shows himself strong. You see, that's what he wants to do for us. But as long as we try to fix everything and try to work it out and try to figure it out and depend on other people, then God sits on the sidelines and he waits for us. He can't get into the game of life as long as we keep him on the sidelines. 
I've heard people say, well, I tried everything else. I guess I'll just pray. Oh my goodness. I believe this statement hurts the heart of our Father. We pray first, and then we ask God to give his wisdom and his direction, and then we wait for his answer. I've seen people get in so much trouble because they went ahead and did not seek the Lord first. You know, our flesh, it wants to go, and it wants to do all kinds of things, but our spirit wants to hold us back from certain things that are maybe not God's timing or maybe not for us at all. Well, when we are able to have our pleasures and do our own thing, where does God fit in? Now, don't get me wrong. I have no problem with pleasures and getting together in sports and family and so forth. But the question is, where is God in the midst of all of this? Is he first in your life? Or is he only important in hard times? Have you forgotten him in good times? Our life right now is not business as usual. I believe this is a preview of what is to come, and this is the beginning of the birth pangs. However, God has a great plan and is calling the church to rise up. This is the church's finest hour. The harvest is ripe with many people that have not accepted Jesus into their heart. Many people are hurting, and they are afraid, and they don't know Jesus. I praise God that he has given us technology to reach out to each other and those that are hurting even when we are at a stay-at-home order from our states. There is a sadness and a grief that is all around us. Many of us are wondering, will we ever get back to the way it was? Well, this may surprise you, but I hope we don't where the church is concerned. It's not about going to church on Sunday and the rest of the week letting God out of our plans. We are in crucial times and we need our Father. He is full of love for us and he is always with us in the midst of losing our loved ones here on earth. God doesn't desire that anyone perishes. He is calling out to the world with the words, I love you. I love you. His desire is that we answer his call. And I believe God wants to give us hope today. Isaiah 51, 15 says, For I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, and who by rebuke restrains it. The Lord of hosts is his name. So think of this. God stirs up the seas and the waves roar, and he also speaks to it to calm down. God knows exactly what to do about this virus. He isn't standing here wringing his hands and saying, gee, I didn't expect this. I don't know what we're going to do. God can suddenly stop this virus as he has removed all the frogs from the Egyptians from the plague. And remember, he took all of the Israelites, and he will take care of all his children. Those ten plagues didn't touch the Israelites. They touched the Egyptians. God set them apart, and he set them aside, and he took care of them. Now, does that mean that we're not going to experience any sadness or go through hard times? Of course not. But he does promise that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And before Palm Sunday's message, I had ended with the 10th plague, which had killed every Egyptian's firstborn child and animal. And when the labor got harder and people were upset with Moses, God had promised him that Pharaoh would literally drive the Israelites out of the land and they would be given much treasure. Well, that didn't make any sense because it sure didn't look like it. But at the time, it was not God's timing. And that, when it comes to God's timing, that's when it happens. And now, Moses has been raised up. All this has taken place. 
And now the Israelites can shout hallelujah and they're leaving Egypt and they're going into the promised land. But there are things that have to, they have to go through to get to that promised land. They have no idea what is ahead of them. They've got a massive miracle ahead of them and they have no idea of that. But actually they're going to see some really heavy jaw-dropping, knock your socks off, supernatural miracles. So let's define what a miracle is. A miracle is an event not explainable by, nature, by natural or scientific law. An extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. It's also an intervention in the natural universe by God. In other words, God gets in there and he intervenes. And it's a divine act by God who reveals himself to the people. So think about this. God caused 10 plagues to come into, onto the Egyptians for Pharaoh to see what he wanted his people, that he wanted his people released. And even when Pharaoh would beg Moses to ask God to get rid of them, Immediately the frogs left. So if you can imagine frogs everywhere, and all of a sudden God says go, and they're gone. Now, nothing is too difficult for him, including this pandemic. God can make this disappear suddenly. So let's talk about one of those knock-your-socks-off miracles in the Bible. The Lord told Moses to father all men, women, and children along with the foreigners in their land, so they could learn to fear the Lord. And that's taken from Deuteronomy 31, 12. He told them to father them, to take care of them, to be there for them, to listen to their heart, to listen to what was going on, listen to their fears. But he wanted them to learn how to fear God. So what kind of fear did God want them to have? You know, I grew up with religion, and it taught me a very unhealthy fear of God. When I accepted Jesus into my heart at the age of six, I ran to the altar because I was so scared to death of going to hell. No one was talking about the love of God. I was taught the wrath and judgment of God. I saw him as a demanding drill sergeant up there with a clipboard keeping a record of all my sins. But when he wrapped his loving arms around me, in the midst of a devastating time in my life, I began to have a relationship with him. And as I have become more intimate with my father, I have an awe of his presence in the hard times, as well as the good times. Now, the Israelites have been traveling in the wilderness with God's protection day and night. Their shoes aren't wearing out. God is feeding them manna from heaven and having mercy on them. When they're grumbling and complaining, he's given mercy. Take notice. Part of leading up to the Red Sea miracle was a wilderness experience. They didn't know where they were going and they had to learn how to live every day depending on God to feed them and protect them. God wanted to teach the Israelites how to trust and rely and cling to him. He loved them, and he wanted them to see and feel his love. He showed them his protection, and he took them a longer route because otherwise they would have gotten into a war with the Philistines. But he So think of this. The mercy of God didn't lead them into a battle. Since they knew they were already worn out with living under the oppression, Exodus 14, 1-2 says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back. And he told them where to camp and right where the sea was. And God and Moses had a relationship going on. And see, that's what God wants from each one of us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to partner with him. And that is what the Lord requires of us. So 
In verse 3 it says, For Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will be glorified and honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, the tables were about to be turned. Pharaoh and all his army were coming after, would be coming after the Israelites, God's children. But God was already ahead of that, and he knew what he was going to do. You know what? Sounds like a strategy to me. In other words, God was getting them into position for a miracle. He also warned them that the Egyptians would be coming and was preparing them for deliverance. He was saying they would be pursued. However, God would receive the glory and all the Egyptians would acknowledge that he was the Lord. So not only were the Israelites seeing and knowing that he was the Lord, but the Egyptians would acknowledge that he was the Lord. So think about this. God took them out of the hands of the Egyptians Yet he moved them into a wilderness where they had to learn how to depend upon God for everything. So you think about this. Have you ever been in a wilderness? I believe many of us feel right now that we're in a wilderness. Some of you have lost your jobs. And you'll have no idea when you're going to be returning to that job. Or if that job's even going to stay there. And perhaps you're wondering how you're going to pay your rent. And some of you have lost your loved ones to this virus and in our deep grieving time. And others may have contracted this virus and wondering if or how you're going to come through this. Many of us are in that position right now in that wilderness. But you see, God is already ahead of this. And he knows exactly what is going to take place. And if you hold on to his hand and believe him, he will take you through this. So going back to Egypt, <laughs> the Pharaoh's like, he's got a change of heart. He drove those Egypt uh, Israelites out of Egypt. Literally drove them out, said, get out of here. And now he's got a change of heart. Oh, and it's not soft. It's hard. And he's thinking, huh, what did I do? I left all our slaves go. We have no slaves here. Okay, we need to go after them. And everything that God had told Moses was going to happen now. God will give us warnings to prepare us. Sometimes he'll give us a warning dream. And if God gives you a warning dream of something, the first thing you do is ask him what it's about and how to pray. <laughs> but now the enemy's ganging up on them. Imagine this. They've been in a wilderness. They don't know what's going on next. They don't know what's ahead. But God has given them promises to hold on to. And does it look like God is going to fulfill those promises? No. No. And sometimes we look at things and we say, God, where are you? You promised this. You promised that. And then we don't see those promises. And so what do we do? Sometimes we get so discouraged and we walk away and we don't want anything to do with God. We don't want to even hear about God. And then what happens? God is there. He promised that he'd never leave us or forsake us. And sometimes we just don't feel that he's there. And we don't see that he's there. But God is. He is there for each one of us. And so when God looked at Moses, he knew that Moses would obey him. And so he had to continue on. Oh, the people were looking all around in fear and they were thinking about all the promises that they're not seeing. But they were focused on the Egyptian army, the enemy. And then, is this what we do when things look so dark and bleak and seem like they're never going to change? 
Are we focused on the enemy's army or are we holding on to our father's promises? You see, their focus now is on Moses and he's being blamed for taking them out of Egypt. And then verse 11 says, then they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What is this that you have done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? You know, here we are, we're celebrating, yay, hallelujah, we're out of Egypt now. But now it's not looking like we thought it was going to. And so now it's like, oh, Moses, look what you did. You took us out. Did you leave us alone? Why didn't you leave us alone? But you know what? Did they forget what it was like to be under the hard labor day after day? Did they forget how God spoke to Moses for them every day? Did they forget God's promise of his receiving the glory? And did they forget how God is protecting them by day by a cloud and a fire by night? Did they forget how God rescued them from Pharaoh before? Couldn't he rescue them again? When we get into hard times and we need a miracle, what thoughts are we having? Think about that. What thoughts are you having right now? We need a miracle. What thoughts are you listening to that the enemy wants to bring into your mind? The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. Would Jesus think that way? No, he would not. So at this point, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Take your stand. Be firm and confident and undismayed. That's what being, taking your stand means. Stand firm. Be confident. Don't be dismayed. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. And this scripture says today. God told him, this is what's going to happen. And he said, the Egyptians you have seen today, you will never see again. Well, it didn't look like that. You've got this red, you've got this huge sea. You've got the Egyptians on the one side and the Red Sea on the other. And then he says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent and remain calm. Sometimes it's a matter of keeping silent and remaining calm. So how do you do that when you see the Egyptians on one side and the Red Sea on the other? Well, one day I heard the Holy Spirit ask me this question. Who was the Israelites' greatest enemy? The Red Sea or the Egyptians? And I thought about that. And I thought, wow, I don't think I'd want to face either one of them. That would be hard for me to know which one. I said, I don't know, Lord. And then he said, it was the fear that was their greatest enemy. So in order to stay calm, they had to give God the fear. Our Father has extravagant love for us. He's calling each one of us to come to him, listen and obey and co-labor with him. And I would like to encourage you, if you are fearful in this pandemic, Get real with God and tell him what you feel. He already knows, but you need to talk to him about it and then give it over to him. He wants you to know that his perfect love casts out that fear. And so perhaps you've never accepted Jesus into your heart. Today could be a life changer for you. Does this mean you're never going to have any problems? Of course not. It just means that the Holy Spirit will be there to guide you with all of your problems. We cannot come to Jesus with a full understanding and intellect. We come to him believing that he is the Son of God. He forgives our sins. And he continually cleanses us from those sins because we are sinners fallen short of the glory of God. And if you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart, I'm going to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. 
Father, I confess that I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus died and was raised from the dead so I could live forever with you. I ask you to come into my heart and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I give you all my plans for my life and I ask you to show me your plan. I now make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you have prayed this prayer with me this morning, congratulations. You have joined the family of God. And I would love to hear from you. So please message me on Facebook. And then perhaps you've already accepted Jesus into your heart. But you have not made God the Lord of your life. Or you have strayed away from him to accomplish your own plan. I'm going to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I ask you to forgive my sins of trying to accomplish my own plan and not caring what your plans are for me. I am sorry, and I give you all my plans. I'm coming back to my first love. I ask you to show me what your plans are for me. Oh God, search my heart and reveal and heal those wounds that have kept me in bitterness resentment and anger your word says if i draw near to you you will draw near to me i ask you to draw near to me today i want to have a relationship with you from this day forward and make you the lord of my life in jesus name well next week we will continue this message on expect miracles and if these messages are touching your heart and you would like to send us a love offering, you can mail it to the Upper Room Worship Center, 76 Shawnee Drive, Belleville, Pennsylvania, 17004. So I just want to pray with you. Thank you, Father, for this time of all being together, to be able to hear your word, to be able to have an open heart, to hear what you have to say. Thank you that you are our rear guard to protect us, that the angel of the Lord is encamped around us and you have pitched a tent and you are resting with us. Thank you, Lord, that you've already walked our journey, that we don't have to fear, we don't have to worry and be anxious, but Lord, you've already walked it and you're ahead of everything. And most of all, you are within us. So I speak favor and blessings over each one of you. God loves you, and so do we.